I'd like to share one of my very favorite historical fiction books. I'm doing this because I want you to hear a historical fiction story, and I want to point out some things in this book. So this book <coughs> you may or may not have seen before. It is called Thank You, Mr. Falker. It's written by Patricia Polacco, who's a very famous children's book author. To George Falker, the real Mr. Falker, who you will forever be my hero. Dedication. The grandpa held a jar of honey so that all the family could see, then dipped a ladle into it and drizzled honey on the cover of a small book. The little girl had just turned five. Stand up, little one, he cooed. I did this for your mother, your uncles, your older brother, and now you. Then he handed the book to her. Taste. She dipped her finger into the honey and put it in her mouth. What is that taste? The grandma asked. The little girl answered, sweet. So remember, we have dialogue here. Then all of the family said in a single voice, yes, and so is knowledge. But knowledge is like the bee that made the sweet honey. You have to chase it through the pages of a book. The little girl knew that the promise to read was at last hers. Soon, she was going to learn how to read. <coughs> Trisha, the littlest girl in the family, grew up loving books. Her school teacher mother read to her every night. Her redheaded brother brought his books home from school and shared them. And whenever she visited the family farm, her grandfather or grandmother read to her by the stone fireplace. When she turned five and went to kindergarten, most of all, she hoped to read. Each day, she saw the kids in first grade across the hall reading. And before the year was over, some of the kids in her own class began to read, not Trisha. Still, she loved being at school because she could draw. The other kids would crowd around her and watch her do her magic with the crayons. In first grade, you'll learn to read, her brother said. In first grade, Trisha sat in a circle with the other kids. They were all holding our neighborhood, the first reader, sounding out letters and words. They said, Bay, bay, oi, boy, and la, la, look, look. The teacher smiled at them when they put all the sounds together and got a word right. But when Trisha looked at a page, all she saw were wiggling shapes. And when she tried to sound out words, the other kids laughed at her. Trisha, what are you looking at in that book? Why are you laughing at that? I'm reading, she'd say, and look back at them. But her teacher would move on to the next person. Always when it was her turn to read, the teacher had to help her with every single word. And while the other kids moved up into the second reader and the third reader, she stayed alone in our neighborhood. Trisha began to feel a little different. She began to feel dumb. The harder words got for the little girl, the more and more time she spent drawing, how she loved to draw, or just sitting and dreaming, or when she could, going for walks with her grandmother. One summer day, she and her grandma were walking together in the small woods behind their farm. It was twilight. The air was sweet and warm. Fireflies were just coming up from the grasses. As they walked, Trisha asked, Grandma, do you think I'm different? Of course, her grandmother answered, to be different is the miracle of life. You see all those little flyers, fireflies, everyone is different. Do you think I'm smart? Trisha didn't feel smart. Her grandma hugged her. You're the smartest, quickest, dearest little thing ever. Right then, that little girl felt very safe in her grandmother's arms. Reading didn't matter so much. <coughs> Trisha's grandmother used to say that the stars were holes in the sky. They were light of heaven coming from the other side, and she used to say that someday she would be on the other side where the light comes from. One evening, they lay on the grass together and counted the lights from heaven. You know, her grandma said, all of us will go there someday. Hang on to the grass or you'll lift right off the ground and there you'll be. They laughed and both hung on to the grass. But it was not long after that night that her grandmother must have let go of the grass because she went to where the lights were on the other side. And not long after that, Trisha's grandpa let go of the grass too. School seemed much harder now. Reading was just plain torture. When Sue Ellen read her page or Tommy Bob read his page, they read so easily that Trisha would watch the top of their heads to see if something was happening to their heads that wasn't happening to hers. The numbers were the hardest thing to read of all. She never added anything upright. Line up the numbers before you add them, the teacher would say. But when Trisha tried, the numbers would look like a stack of blocks, wobbly and ready to fall. She knew she was just dumb. Then one day her mother announced that she'd gotten a teaching job in California, a long way from the family farm in Michigan. <clears throat> Even though her grandma and grandpa were gone, the little girl didn't want to move. Maybe though the teachers and the kids in her new school wouldn't know how dumb she was. 
She and her mother and brother moved across the country in a two-tone 1949 Plymouth that took five days. So again, we're telling about the car that they're driving in, their clothes, their hairstyles, are helping us to know that it's a historical fiction book. But at the new school, it was the same. When she tried to read, she stumbled over words. The cat ran. She was reading like a baby in the third grade. And when her teacher read along with them and called on Trisha for an answer, she gave the wrong answer every time. Hey, dummy, a boy crawled out to her on the playground. How could you be so dumb? Other kids stood near him and they laughed. Trish, Trisha could feel the tears burning in her eyes, how she longed to go back to her grandparents' farm in Michigan. Now Trisha wanted to go to school less and less. I have a sore throat, she'd say to her mom, or I have a stomach ache. She dreamed more and more and drew more and more, and she hated, hated, hated school. But then when Trisha started fifth grade, the school was all abuzz. There was a new teacher. He was tall and elegant. Everybody loved his striped coat and his slick gray pants. He wore the neatest clothes. All the usual teacher pets gathered around him. Stevie Joe, Alice Marie, Davy, Michael Lee. But right from the start, it didn't seem to matter to Mr. Falker which kids were the cutest or the smartest or the best at anything. You notice also the blackboards. That's something we don't have in our classrooms anymore. So another way that our pictures, our illustrations are showing us that this was set in an earlier time. Plus, people don't typically dress like this for school anymore. <clears throat> and we don't have these kind of desks. Mr. Falker would stand behind Trisha whenever she was drawing and whisper, this is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Do you know how talented you are? When he said this, even the kids who teased her would turn around in their seats and look at her drawings, but they still laughed at her whenever she gave a wrong answer. Then one day she had to stand up and read, which she hated. She was stumbling through a page in Charlotte's Web and the page was going all fuzzy when the kids began to laugh out loud. Mr. Falker in his plaid jacket and butterfly tie said, stop, are all of you so perfect that you can look at another person and find fault with her? That was the last day anybody laughed out loud or made fun of her, all except Eric. He'd sat behind Trisha for two whole years and he seemed almost to hate her. Trisha didn't know why. He waited by the door of the classroom for her and pulled her hair. He waited for her in the playground, leaned in her face and called her Toad. Trisha was afraid to turn any corner for fear that Eric would be there. She felt completely alone. The only time she was really happy was when she was around Mr. Falker. He let her erase the blackboards. Only the best students got to do that. He patted her on the back whenever she got something right, and he looked hard and mean at any kid who teased her. But the nicer Mr. Falker was to Trisha, the worse it got. Eric treated her. The worse Eric treated her. He got all the other students to wait for her on the playground, or in the cafeteria, or even in the bathroom, and to jump out and call her stupid or ugly. And Trisha began to believe them. She discovered that if she asked to go to the bathroom just before recess, she could hide under the inside stairwell during the free time and not have to go outside at all. In that dark place, she felt completely safe. But one day at recess, Eric followed her to her secret hiding place. Have you become a mole? He laughed. Then he pulled her into the hallway and danced around her. Dumbbell, dumbbell, double it, maggoty old dumbbell. Trisha buried her head into her arms and was curled into a ball. Suddenly she heard footsteps. It was Mr. Falker. He marched Eric to the office. When he came back, he found Trisha. I don't think you'll ever have to worry about that boy again, he said softly. What was he teasing you about, little one? I don't know, Trisha shrugged. Trisha was so sure that Mr. Falker believed she could read. And she had learned to memorize what the kid next to her was reading. Or she'd wait for Mr. Falker to help her with a sentence, and then she'd say the same thing that he did. Good, he would say. Then one day, Mr. Falker asked her to stay after school and help wash the blackboards. He put on music and brought out little sandwiches as they worked and talked. All at once, he said, let's play a game. I'll shout out the letters. You write them on the board with the wet sponge as quickly as you can. A, he shouted. She wiped a watery A. Eight, he shouted. She made a watery eight. Fourteen, three, D, M, Q, he shouted. He shouted out many, many letters and numbers. Then he walked up behind her and together they looked at the board. It was a watery mess. Trisha knew that none of her letters or numbers looked like they should. She threw the sponge down and tried to run. But Mr. Falker caught her arm and sank to his knees in front of her. You poor baby, he said. You think you're dumb, don't you? How awful for you to be so lonely and afraid. She sobbed. But little one, don't you understand? You don't see letters or numbers the way that other people do. 
You've gotten through school all this time and fooled many, many good teachers. He smiled at her. That took cunning and smartness and such, such bravery. <clears throat> then he stood up and finished washing the board. We're going to change all that, girl. You're going to read. I promise you that. Now, almost every day after school, she met with Mr. Falker and Miss Plessy, a reading teacher. They did a lot of things she didn't even understand. At first, she made circles in the sand, then big sponge circles on the blackboard, going from left to right, left to right. Another day, she flicked letters on a screen, and Trisha shouted them out loud. Still, other days, she worked with wooden blocks and built words, letters, 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 words, 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 always sounding them out, and that felt good. But though she'd read the words, she hadn't read a whole sentence, and deep down, she still felt dumb. And then one spring break, one spring day, had it been three months or four months since they started, Mr. Falker put a book in front of her. She'd never seen it before. He picked a paragraph in the middle of the page and pointed at it. Almost as if it were magic or as if a light poured into her brain, the words and sentences started to take shape on the page as they'd never done before. She marched them off to... Slowly she read a sentence, then another, then another, and finally she read a paragraph, and now she understood the whole thing. She didn't notice that Mr. Falker and Miss Plessy had tears in their eyes. <clears throat> that night, Trisha ran home without stopping to catch her breath. She mounted up the front steps, threw open the kitchen door, and ran through the dining room to the kitchen. She climbed up in the cupboard and grabbed a jar of honey. Then she went to the living room and found the book on a shelf, the very book her grandpa had shown her so many years ago. She spooned honey on the cover, tasted the sweetness, and said to herself, the honey is sweet, and so is knowledge. But knowledge is like the bee who made the honey. It has to be chased through the pages of the book. Then she held the book and honey, book, honey and all, close to her chest. She could feel tears rolling down her cheeks, but they weren't tears of sadness. She was happy, very happy. The rest of the year became an odyssey of discovery and adventure for the little girl. She learned to love school. I know, because that little girl was me, Patricia Polacco. I never saw, I'm sorry, I saw Mr. Falker again some 30 years later at a wedding. I walked up to him and introduced myself. At first, he had difficulty placing me. Then I told him who I was and how he changed my life so many years ago. He hugged me and asked me what I did for a living. Why, Mr. Falker, I answered. I make books for children. Thank you, Mr. Falker. Thank you. The end. So you can see that this is historical fiction because it was set back in the 1950s. We know this because the photos and because the comments that were made. We also know that while this is a real story and it did happen, she changed some things. So it makes it fiction. So even though it's based on true thing that happened about Patricia Polacco, the author's childhood, we know from here that she changed Mr. Felker into Mr. Falker in the book. So it's a different name. So that makes it fiction. So that's why it is a historical fiction book. Just like you're going to tell a historical fiction story. You're going to tell us, you're going to use some dialogue. You're going to have great characters. You're going to have the characters and the setting give us some indications about what period of history it is in. And you're going to do your very, very best to develop a story that starts with a problem. The problem gets worse and we hit a climax. Here, when is the climax of this book? What is the most exciting part? I would say the most exciting part <clears throat> is when all of a sudden Eric finds her and starts teasing her. Because after that, don't we start finding some resolution? Mr. Falker knows at this point that something is wrong. And he defines out in the very next page what is wrong, and they start working to solve the problem. So that is the rise in action up to the climax, and now the falling action as they're solving the problem. Okay? Hopefully that helps by hearing another historical fiction story so that you know what you can work on. If you have any questions, please come to Zoom with me, 2.15 this afternoon. Thank you.